In 2012, a 25-year-old rapper from Toronto, Canada embarked on the second tour of his career, just a few months after dropping his second album, a modern masterpiece that mixed sentimental R&B with pop rap, with contrasting themes of family, loneliness, sex, romance, fame, and money. On top of luxurious instrumentals, it was an instant hit. It sold 600,000 copies in its first week, and it won Best Rap Album at the 2013 Grammys. Of course, in the same vein, the accompanying tour was the highest grossing rap tour of the year. It made over $50 million with stops in over 60 cities around the world, with tickets at many venues selling out completely in a matter of minutes. Equally as important, though, were the tour's opening acts. Two other rising rappers, a 24-year-old from Compton, California, and a 23-year-old from Harlem in New York. In 2012, three rising stars stood on stages together, all over the world, singing, performing, calling each other family, and celebrating their success as equals. This is my brother ASAP Rocky. This is my brother Kendrick Lamar. But 12 years later, they would rip each other apart in an even more public setting than the stages they shared at the beginning of their careers, desperately trying to reveal each other's deepest secrets, no matter what the cost might be. If you're interested in more of my creations, my new brand Spirit World just relaunched our sold out necklace after it's been back ordered for six months. Every necklace is made of full 925 sterling silver with hand painted enamel and the design of a sun rising over a night full of silver stars. They're designed by me and the brand directly supports Volksgeist while also telling stories with powerful meaning for every creative person. I made the necklaces to be a reminder that whatever your goal is, the only way to reach it is to just keep going. Whatever kind of success you're chasing, persistence and belief is the key, because there can't be any light without dark. There can't be success without struggle. If you want to support my work and buy a pendant from our collection, feel free to pick up at the link below. And shipping is free in the US forever, so go to spiritworld.store to buy a necklace now or stick till the end for a discount code that's just for my viewers. Plus one random buyer from the first 10 orders off this video will have their purchase completely refunded and will get their necklace for free. The industry records that Drake holds would take all day to list, from 13 number one albums to 30 number one rap songs on Billboard to over 99 billion total streams on Spotify. He's the only artist in history to spend 3,000 cumulative weeks on both the singles and the album's charts. He holds the most number one singles ever by a solo male artist, a record tied only by Michael Jackson. And he may not be the first one to ever do it, but when it comes to the last 15 years of hip hop artists mixing rapping with smooth melodic R&B sounds to become the new sound of pop, Drake is the undisputed king. When it comes to Drake's impact and influence, almost every critic has written something along the lines of, thanks to Drake, now nearly every singer raps and nearly every rapper sings. Drake has become so impactful that the boldness or unprecedented sound of his early work has slowly become status quo because it was just that influential. And with a moment in the limelight lasting as many years as Drake's has, his influence on music culture itself goes much, much deeper than just sales or songs. He did a lot to put Toronto's music scene on the map. He's done a ton to help popularize UK hip-hop artists in North America. He pioneered the use of memes and social media as music marketing. He's given out countless features and support to help rising artists break into the mainstream. Going from his first mixtape in 2006, for which he received $300 in royalties and was opening concerts at bars for $100, to 15 years later when he reached the point of being responsible for over 5% of the tourism income for the entire country of Canada and over 1% of all streams on Spotify every year, Drake is the biggest rapper in the world, and the gap to whoever might stand behind him is massive. Even more so, his 15 minutes of fame has lasted almost 15 years. He's not just a star, he's a black hole. His gravity has become so strong that his presence isn't just mainstream, it's inescapable. And with that inescapable, prolific musical output also comes a widespread fascination with Drake the person. Beyond typical celebrity, Drake's existence has passed into the realm of surreal spectacle. The right to privacy simply no longer exists. Like many other entertainers who have reached a one-of-one -one level of fame, the line between Drake the rapper rapper and Aubrey Drake Graham has blurred to the point where neither one exists without the other. Who really is he? What are his true motives? What's going on behind the scenes? And what is he hiding? These are the sort of questions that become unavoidable for anyone who reaches even halfway as far up the mountain as Drake has. History shows that people who are driven to reach such an extreme level of fame can most often be just as extreme in their own lives, which for many onlookers can be even more fascinating than the music they create, sometimes eclipsing their artistic legacy almost entirely.
A year after Kendrick and Drake stood on stage together as brothers, featured on each other's albums, and even made a hit together on Fucking Problems by ASAP Rocky, Kendrick fired a warning shot that was heard around the world. In the middle of a three minute verse on a Big Sean song, he declared himself one of the goats, not just by saying it, but by name dropping every other rising rapper he was competing with. Everyone was in his sights, from Mac Miller to ASAP Rocky, Tyler the Creator, Jay Electronica, Big Sean, Big Crit, Wale, J. Cole, all the way to Pusha T, Meek Mill, and finally, Drake. The song put a big spotlight on Kendrick, who at the time was yet to reach his first number one album. It was a pretty big moment though in the marking of a new era of rap, and it's still remembered to this day. It's easy to see why. The new generation had begun, and Kendrick was claiming his spot at the head of the table by cutting the heads off of everyone else sitting there with him. Over 20 rappers responded to Kendrick's crowning himself the new king of rap. He even called himself the king of New York. It was pretty spicy, but it didn't really start any beefs. Kendrick even said in the verse, I have love for you guys, I just want to be better than you. And understandably, while many artists replied, actually more rappers made songs replying than he had actually named in the original lyrics. Most people understood it wasn't really that serious. It was something to drum up headlines, bring some attention, and get a conversation started. A lot of the people he listed were his own friends, ASAP Rocky, Mac Miller, Big Sean, these were his buddies, but there was one exception. While at first they kind of addressed it outright by playing it down and both of them went on record saying, we're not beefing, we're just two different types of artists, you know there's saying? no issue. Um, and, and he's doing his thing really well. Um, and that verse was, he's giving people like moments, you know, like that, that verse was a, a moment to talk about. Um, are you listening to it now at this point in time? Okay. And then it was it was real cool for like, you know, a couple weeks. But like if I asked you, for example, like, how does that verse? As time went on, they ended up dissing each other well over a combined 50 times. Competition is essential to hip hop and both Drake and Kendrick just wanted to be the best. Of course, they'd try to knock each other off their pedestals to prove a point. It wasn't a friendly rivalry, but it didn't seem serious either. At least that was the case until former NFL player Marcellus Wiley revealed that Drake had come in for an interview on his show and had an emotional outburst where he dissed Kendrick Lamar multiple times before threatening to sue if the interview was ever aired. The beef continued into the late 2010s and onward as the two artists got more and more mainstream, more and more popular. At the same time, the disses got more and more direct and serious. A full timeline of their back and forth would be an entire video even longer than this one. From massive hits like All the Stars from Black Panther to deep cuts like Sandra's Rose, they just kept going back and forth across albums, across singles. It became clear that any fun Kendrick and Drake had ever been having with their rivalry had disappeared a long time ago. But still though, as recently as last year, dedicated fans on Reddit threads and Twitter posts were convinced that nothing would ever really happen. Drake and Kendrick were part of the big three, so why would they ever beef with each other in seriousness? People said that they were too popular to fight like that. Plus, it had already been 10 years. It was too late. They moved on to other things. The Drake and Kendrick beef had become an urban legend, something that, while technically possible, was far beyond the bounds of believability. That is, until the 6th of October, 2023. When Like That comes out six months later with a surprise verse from Kendrick saying, motherfuck the big three, it's just big me, everything changed. Drake is one of the most visible figures in Western pop culture, but he still maintains an air of mystery. It's long been talked about how Drake doesn't actually share anything about himself in his lyrics, but rather that his songs are the musical equivalent of mildly emotional vague posting about nameless faces and places. There isn't a timeline of Drake's life that can be pieced together from his music. For the most part, what we see is his money, a private jet, but not just any private jet, a $180 million Boeing 767 painted blue with a custom design by Virgil Abloh with three bedrooms on board, a mansion, but not just any mansion, a 50,000 square foot home with a 3,000 square foot master bedroom, an NBA regulation basketball court, 50 foot ceilings, a 4,000 pound black marble bathtub, a record deal, 
but not just any record deal, the most valuable record deal of all time, worth over $400 million. But beyond the jaw-dropping luxury, the sold-out shows, the champagne toasts, the side of Drake that we can observe on social media paints a strange picture. There's a reason why there are forum posts all over the internet, across many years, asking, is Drake an alcoholic? Does he have a gambling problem? Is he a sex addict? His Instagram feed is littered with drinks, gambling, hookah sessions, and a conspicuous lack of relationships. It's been more than eight years since Drake has publicly dated anybody. Despite hundreds of songs that mention women, sex, and dating, no one has seen any proof at all that Drake has even been in a relationship since he was in his 20s. But as rumors run deeper and you take a closer look, what you find about Drake's life isn't a secret relationship that he hides to protect his privacy, but instead all sorts of other relationships of a completely different kind. For years, it's been documented that Drake has serious connections to the criminal underworld in Toronto. There's evidence everywhere, like a signed artist on his label being a former convict who has at different points been charged with human trafficking, armed robbery, assault, and possession of drugs for trafficking. But even deeper, in recent years, he's become notorious for filling his lyrics with references to gang culture, bragging about mysterious shooters that he has on payroll, or being untouchable, or even having paid to have people killed. Whether or not Drake actually is a made man in a structured high-level criminal organization, or just a lyricist trying to find catchy hooks for his songs is unclear. Even on the most normal of songs like God's Plan, he finds a way to subtly shout out a violent motorcycle gang. There are even deeper cuts like Circo Loco or Stories About My Brother, where he explicitly shouts out his relationship with a Houston-based record label owner who has called Drake his son multiple times in the past. That person is, of course, Jay Prince, who was previously investigated for organized criminal activity by the DEA for over 12 years. He's often considered by many to run the criminal underworld in Houston, Texas. There are even stories about Drake himself sending hitters to confront the radio host Charlemagne for jokes he made about Drake's music early in his career. Plus, of course, the persistent rumor that Drake is the person responsible for the mysterious death of XXXTentacion over six years ago. But that's not even the full extent of Drake's legally blurry, morally gray connections and relationships. Over the years, an interest in much younger women has become a key point of discussing Drake's character. Drake has taken a strong public interest to many women who were not at all of a normal or even legal age at the time of his association with them. Strange actions like texting I miss you or giving advice about boys to Millie Bobby Brown when she was 14 years old, writing songs to and about Georgia Smith when she was 19 and he was 32, going to Kylie Jenner's Sweet 16 and being publicly affectionate when he was pushing 30, being friends with Hailey Bieber from the age of 14 until they started dating when she was 19 and he was 29. But none of this really lies beyond the realm of respectable behavior in the entertainment industry. No one expects celebrities to be moral role models, and nothing I've just said is even all that unusual in context. So why does Drake suddenly have so many enemies in the rap game when no one at all outside of a somewhat vocal minority of obsessive internet observers seems to really care about his behavior in any meaningful way? For the past 10 years that he's been doing these seedy, disturbing, but still legal things. Weeks went by unnoticed. No one was knocking Drake's door down for a response, because like I said, no one ever even thought the beef was possible to begin with. Plus, Kendrick's initial shots came four months after First Person Shooter even came out. It wasn't an emergency. That is, until April 19th, a month after Kendrick fired shots on Like That, Drake leaked his own diss song, Push Ups to the Public, and he ignited the beef in seriousness. Push Ups is a pretty elementary diss track. I mean, that's what it's supposed to be. There's no big reveal, no huge insults, just Drake flinging a flurry of shots at Kendrick and everyone else who subbed him on Future and Metro Boomin's album. Drop and give them 50. 
He emphasizes that he's the biggest rapper in the game, that none of them can even come close, and that above all, Kendrick is a short, corny loser who's been dissing him for years, but still can't be as famous or rich as he is. He writes, you ain't in no big three, SZA got you wiped down, Travis got you wiped down, Savage got you wiped down. He's leaning heavy on the fact that Kendrick hasn't made music in a long time. As Drake writes the story, Kendrick has nothing on him. He doesn't even come close, and it was nothing more than an annoyance for Drake to even address the beef at all. And you gon' feel the aftermath of what I write down. I'm at the top of the mountain, so you tight now. Just to add his talk with your ass, I had to hike down. Big difference between Mike then and Mike now. What the fuck is this, a 20v1, nigga? Half the song is even dedicated to attacking all the other people who sided with Kendrick, of which there were a lot. Push-ups was a good opening move. He put Kendrick in his place without getting too violent, without getting too personal, and it opens the door for another round. Of course, it was met with a huge reaction. The beef that no one thought would ever happen was finally starting. But then, nothing. Kendrick's response just didn't come. Fame is a funny thing. It's almost like you have to be messed up to succeed. What kind of normal, well-adjusted person wants to be famous? Who looks into the future at a life where you have no privacy, can't connect with people, can't trust your friends, can't take a break, can't have normal relationships, and says, I want that. For a lot of famous people, the only comfort and enjoyment they get can come from gambling, drinking, empty sex, social media validation. It's all of the downsides of modern life turned up to an absurd level, and all you get in return is a giant marble bathtub to sit in by yourself. What kind of childhood makes a person want that for themselves? What kind of person chases after fame and fortune that becomes so empty when they have to trade away their own relationships and privacy to get it? And who does that person become? Drake didn't start his career as a rapper. At the age of 15, he was lucky enough to be casted on the Canadian teen drama series Degrassi as Jimmy Brooks, a character who becomes disabled after being shot by a classmate. And the story that Drake tells about his early acting career is inspiring. He said, my mother was very sick, we were very poor, and the only money I had was coming in from Canadian TV. He made around $50,000 per year from the show, which realistically isn't that much after all said and done, especially when you're providing for a single parent who can't work because of a serious case of osteoporosis. You see, Drake was raised by a single mom, a school teacher from Toronto, Canada. His father, Dennis, is a working drummer from Memphis, Tennessee, but he didn't raise Drake. At the age of five, his parents divorced and Dennis went back to Memphis, where he was later incarcerated on drug-related criminal charges charges, which prevented him from going back to Canada to visit Drake until many years later. Drake has gone on record many times saying that his father was mostly absent from his life, although Dennis has maintained he always brought Drake to visit him during summer breaks from school as a child. Despite the hardships, Drake was raised in a wealthy, majority Jewish neighborhood on the north side of Toronto called Forest Hill. In 2021, the average income in Forest Hill was over $157,000 per year, more than three times the average for the rest of the city. Drake even dropped out of high school and didn't receive an honorary diploma until many years later. But at the same time as he supported his mom with an acting career, he was also in the early stages of learning the music industry, so much so that he was often late to Degrassi because he spent all night recording music. Until the point when the set's security guards began allowing him to sleep in dressing rooms so he could finally show up to filming on time. Over the years, that experience became a big part of Drake's mythology. Started from the Bottom was a huge hit back in 2013. It's one of his first big singles. Overall, his humble beginnings, especially the sacrifices he made to help his mom and the sacrifices she made to help him, it's been a major source of inspiration for lyrics on many songs. I guess it's Fuck Me, Sandra's Rose, You and the Six. These are all great examples of Drake telling this story stressing over not having his father in his life, having no help from the man who was supposed to raise him and take care of his mother. Pain that I seen in my mother's eyes in 2009 Had me work until it's 2049 And get hey when I tell you oh, some other time Like I really got some other time you just tell me never mind. No, I sound crazy to a lazy mind. Needing to provide for his mother when her health was uncertain, being in a position where he couldn't even finish his education because he was too busy paying the bills, that's not a good childhood experience, even if you're making a lower middle class salary acting on TV. But Drake now, his mansion, his plane, being loved by millions, it's the dream of hip hop culture as a whole. You start at the bottom and you claw your way up to achieve not just success, but success beyond belief. Drake not only became a famous rapper but became the most famous rapper, breaking records that people 
people thought would stand forever. So why do his peers suddenly turn on him after 10 years at the top of the game? Why did Kendrick and almost every other A-list rapper come at his neck, tearing him down from the big three and pinning him as a goofy? Who really is Drake, if not a rapper who worked from the bottom to make his dreams come true, just like everyone else? And what makes other rappers so angry at him? It's not like anything Drake has done is outside the bounds of what's expected for a typical celebrity. Dating inappropriately young women, paying off gangs, being a casual alcoholic, and promoting gambling to millions of people is honestly pretty tame as far as things go. More than anything, it seems like Drake's alienation from real life and the normal world and obsession with money, fame, and validation is the curse of someone who would do anything to feel stable or validated or like they finally have enough because they never did as kids. That is, of course, if that story is even true to begin with. Two weeks passed with no response. The tension and expectation was increasing every day. It got to the point where people thought that Kendrick would never come back, that he had started a beef with no intention to finish it. But then suddenly, Kendrick returned on a random Tuesday with Euphoria. Them superpowers get neutralized, I can only watch in silence. The famous actor- Euphoria is brutal compared to push-ups. The track directly confronts Drake's past as an actor, depicting him as not a real rapper, but an exploitative, lying fake. Kendrick accuses Drake of inauthentically using cultural elements for his own benefit while questioning the truth behind his persona. He seems profoundly disappointed by Drake's public image, adding a deeply personal dimension to their ongoing feud. He's not just a goofy, he's a deceitful fake. With standout lines like the YNW Melly bars and Kendrick taking away Drake's N-word pass, as well as the lines in the first verse where he just says he hates everything about Drake four times in a row, Euphoria feels like the real start to the beef. Let me go left and I see two of them kissing and hugging on stage. I love them to death and then eight bars I'll explain their phrase. It's not nobody can tell me. I don't want to talk on no celly. You know I got language barriers. It's no accent you can sell me. Your cold and I be no. I'm a selfish nigga. The crown is heavy. I pray they my real friends. If not, I'm YNW Melly. I don't like you pop. Again, though, despite the quotable funny lines all throughout the track, the more serious core accusation Kendrick makes is simple yet real. Drake isn't actually hip-hop, and he never was, and Kendrick is here to rip off the mask and expose the lies. He's here to show that Drake's true character is exactly that, nothing but a character. And while push-ups peaked at number 17 on the Hot 100, Euphoria instantly shot up to number 3. The beef was no longer simmering. After 10 years of tension, Kendrick came right out and said it. I hate Drake. Greatest has always been about love and hate. Now let me say I'm the biggest hater. I hate the way that you walk, the way that you talk. I hate the way that you dress. I hate the way that you sneak this. If I catch flight, it's gonna be direct. We and so many people were waiting for that moment. Instantly, there were tens of millions of videos covering this beef. Even the president came out with a parody of Euphoria aimed at Donald Trump. It wasn't a knockout punch or a nuke, but suddenly Drake versus Kendrick was international news. Kendrick hates every aspect of Drake's life and character, and everybody knows it. But he didn't stop there. Three days later, Kendrick dropped 616 in LA, a deeper cut that really started to poke at Drake even further. He calls out that Drake's team and his shadowy street connections are disloyal to him, only seeing him as a source of income, poking at the struggle with paranoia that Drake has written about many times over the years. Well, let's see, have you ever thought that OVO is working for me? Fake bully, I hate bullies, you must be a terrible person. Everyone inside your team is whispering that you deserve it. Can't tussie slide up out of this one, it's just go research. Kendrick claims to really know what's going on underneath the surface thanks to a mole supposedly feeding him secret information behind the scenes, which of course only ignited anticipation for what could possibly be the result of all of these clues and hints. Was Kedrick going to reveal something huge? What's the bigger picture here? And what is it all leading up to? What's up, everybody? You're chilling with me, Aubrey Graham. You guys want to go for a ride? We can go for a ride. This is my baby, I guess. Um, it's a 2004 Acura TSX. It's a nice first car for like a teenager, I guess, as opposed to a Mercedes or BMW. I think that's pretentious, personally. Yeah. Uh, me and my grandma have a little thing where my mom doesn't let her eat chocolate, but uh, my, my grandma slides me a little extra cheddar on the side, and uh, <laughs> I make sure she gets her, her daily chocolate dose. That's so. my grandson. 
Um, this is the living room and Where's my sandwich or something? Um, I didn't buy you that sandwich. Why? Because I I bought um, I bought I bought chicken salad. I'll make you a sandwich. I bought some other things. Why couldn't you just got me that sandwich? Because the lineup was incredible. Um What's this? It's a great sandwich. <laughs> well, give me a chance. Here, well, you, maybe you can get your sandwich. No. Can you talk about it? No. Get out of here. I didn't get my sandwich. I was looking forward to a nice tuna sandwich on a bagel. Oh, tuna. I clearly With an apartment like that, a mother like that, and an attitude like that, it's pretty clear Drake is not really from the bottom. It seems like he started from humble beginnings for sure, and he did face a certain level of adversity and stress, like many people. Divorced parents, bullied in school, trouble with money. And it's obvious actually that someone who grows up like that might end up obsessed with fame and money, desperately seeking validation, stability, and success. Many people find that there's no limit to how far they'll go to feel like they finally have enough of what they didn't have as kids. But what Drake didn't have wasn't stability, money, and a safe, loving home. We can see he did have all of those things. What he really didn't have was an identity. Because there's one element I didn't mention earlier. Drake has talked many, many times about having a difficult time you in know, school. You know, it was, um, I just always felt like an outsider. I, I went, when I was in Forest Hill, you know, it was an all Jew Jewish school, like, and just being, biracial but still being Jewish so I was like kind of connected to the kids but like sort of distant. He was often bullied by other kids for being half Jewish and half black especially because he went to a Jewish day school around other Jewish kids adding that onto it not being raised by his dad but instead by his mother Sandra this isn't how Drake was raised this First is of all, I live in an all Jewish area Forest Hill okay I went to I went to a predominantly Jewish school growing up I definitely had a bar mitzvah in an Italian restaurant, mind you. Uh, the song of the night was Backstreet Boys, I wanted that. When Kendrick says, oh, you think the money, the power, the fame will make you go away, this is what he means. Drake is half black and half Jewish. He's both at the same time, but he was raised very much as a Jewish person with a Jewish education, a bar mitzvah, and all of these Jewish experiences, only embracing also being black once he realized it was the path forward to a bigger career in entertainment. Not at all to say that Drake planned a diabolical fake personality to use while taking over the world with his music, but that he leaned into a black persona he wasn't raised with. It isn't genuine to his life experiences, and that helped him get further as an entertainer. Aubrey Graham is an actor, and the best role he ever played was as a rapper named Drake. I think we've all heard at some point that Drake is always trying out new accents in his music. And if you haven't really ever thought about what that means before, think about it for a second. Drake switches from Jersey Club to Afrobeats to Drill to Dance Hall to New Orleans Bounce to Atlanta Trap like it's nothing. He's done so many different accents, not even just in songs, but on stages. Meanwhile, he comes from a, yes, humble background, but also one that couldn't be further from any Black American life experience. Not to mention all of these different sounds and styles he's constantly playing with. I mean, he's even done verses in Arabic and Spanish before. The more and more that he claims the GOAT status as he rides trends with no strong cultural identity of his own, making music that's, yes, very entertaining, but not at all rooted in the spirit of hip-hop, the more it becomes understandable why his peers would eventually turn on him. He claims to represent hip-hop culture, culture from the hood, while he lived his entire life as a biracial Canadian with a humble but not at all hood upbringing. No one's criticizing Drake for being half white, the same way that no one criticizes J. Cole for being half white. But the issue with Drake is that he's inauthentic. He's not from North Carolina. He didn't grow up in a trailer park having to work odd jobs to survive. He got lucky enough to start an acting career at 14 years old and he's been doing that ever since. It calls back to the idea from earlier. More than anything, it seems like Drake's alienation from real life and the normal world and obsession with money, fame, and validation is the curse of someone who will do anything to feel stable or validated, or like they finally have enough because they never did as kids. As a child, a child who was both black and white at the same time, living in the world of white people, Drake slowly began to take on the persona of a black American without ever knowing what it was like to live as one. Kendrick Lamar isn't mad at him for making music. He even says, I like Drake with the melodies. He's angry that he hides who he really is and built up a character playing at what he thinks it means to be black without ever having lived the life of a black American. In the process, making black culture look bad, perpetuating stereotypes, not taking accountability for his own actions or being self-aware at all. 
At the end of Euphoria, when Kendrick sings, we don't want to hear you say neighbor no more, he gets at the core of his issue with Drake by reminding him that while he is black, he's also white. And in most ways, he's lived life in the white world, taking on the role of a black rapper when needed and slowly becoming more and more disconnected from his own real roots while the stereotypical persona he puts on gets more and more absurd as time goes on. I would even say that this is a big part of why so many people say we don't know Drake from his music. But sometimes it isn't even that deep. Sometimes it really just is cringeworthy. Of course, just three days later, Drake fired back with a seven and a half minute missile strike where he throws a series of image shattering accusations at Kendrick. Mainly that first, one of Kendrick's kids isn't actually his, but is actually the illegitimate son of his manager. Secondly, that Kendrick doesn't actually raise his kids and hasn't seen them in six months. And third, that Kendrick isn't at all committed to his wife, Whitney, and in fact has a history of domestic violence and cheating throughout their relationship. He attacks the brand that Kendrick has built for himself as a moral, virtue person, similarly to the way that Kendrick painted Drake's affinity for and representation for black culture as a false image. If proven true, these accusations would be career ending for Kendrick, the same way that if Drake's black identity is made up, not true to his own experiences, that his claim to being a goat in hip hop history is suddenly fraudulent. Kendrick Lamar has spent his whole career being a voice of ethics, personal growth, and speaking up for social issues. Emphasizing the importance of family and accountability on Mr. Morale is essentially what that entire album was about. Kendrick's music is the kind of stuff that gets played at protests and political rallies. Yes, he has a big commercial presence as well, but almost nothing he's made has ever strayed away from conscious themes. Oftentimes, his music is centered around how to make the right choices in a complex world. His stories always have a moral compass. I would say it's even a much more serious accusation than the attack that Drake isn't really for the culture. The truth about Drake is that he never claimed to be. Kendrick, though, does. If we were to learn that he was in fact not living out any of the messages in his music at all, but instead cheating on, abusing his wife, and not raising his own kids, almost everything Kendrick Lamar has ever said in his music suddenly crumbles to dust. Crown of Diamond Thorns, his albums about personal growth, love, and family, putting his wife and kids on an album cover, it's different. If what Drake said on Family Matters turned out to be true, Kendrick would be ruined. In the summer of 1992 in Los Angeles, a five-year-old Kendrick Lamar got caught in the middle of the Rodney King riots. He remembers it like this. I remember riding with my pops down Bullis Road and looking out the window and seeing people running. I could see smoke, we stopped, and my dad went to the auto zone and came out rolling four tires. I know he didn't buy them. I said, what's going on? We were all taking stuff. That's the way it was in the riots. And the rest of his childhood wasn't much different. He's talked over the years about being permanently changed by seeing a teenage drug dealer shot to death outside of his apartment apartment complex at the age of five. He said, it did something to me right then and there. It let me know that this is not only something I'm looking at, but it's something I have to get used to. In his home life, things weren't much easier. His family lived in Section 8 housing, with his parents having traveled to California to escape the gang violence his father was involved in back in Chicago. They lived on welfare, food stamps, and even sometimes experienced homelessness. But still, Kendrick has discussed good memories of his childhood in Compton, listening to hip-hop music, his parents having house parties, and getting to see Tupac shoot a music video with Dr. Dre in Compton when he was eight years old. The moment he realized he wanted to dedicate his life to following in their footsteps. He later told the story of meeting Dr. Dre 15 years later and explained to him that in a way they had already met, only to find that Dr. Dre remembered the exact moment he was talking about, even down to the neighborhood kids of which Kendrick was one who were standing on the corner. People in Kendrick's life realized that he might be different as early as first grade. When he was only six years old, his teacher encouraged him to become a writer after she heard him properly using words like audacity. Later on, he was introduced to poetry, which became a hugely important tool for helping him deal with the stress and even trauma that affects many kids in Compton and places like it. His teachers continued to encourage him to write, even though his early songwriting was essentially entirely profane. It was seen as a useful coping mechanism for the hardships he was constantly exposed to as a child. 
In high school, Kendrick had a close encounter with a dark path. While attending summer school in the 10th grade, he was pushed by the people around him into a gang war that ended up exposing him to near-death experiences, petty crimes, encounters with police, and eventually the death of a close friend. That close brush with death led him to convert to Christianity, which he had previously considered uninspiring from church experiences as a child. At the same time, he graduated high school with straight A's, while also getting to know Whitney Alford, who he's been on and off with ever since and would later become his fiance and the mother of his children. Kendrick Lamar's music career began largely thanks to Dave Free, a close friend who helped him find places to record while he was first starting out. Dave also had a job as a computer repair technician, and in 2004, when Kendrick was working on his very first mixtapes, Dave Free eventually found himself repairing a computer for Anthony Top Dog Tiffin, a known record producer from LA. Dave seized the opportunity to put Kendrick's music in front of someone who could potentially help them, and Top Dog liked it a lot. Kendrick ended up getting signed as the first client on Top Dog's new record label, Top Dog Entertainment, which ultimately decided the direction of Kendrick's career. Fast forward 20 years, Kendrick Lamar is a giant. If you were to check his Wikipedia article, you'd find people citing him as one of the most influential musicians of the decade, being deemed a paradigm shift in contemporary pop culture. Even further, the consensus seems that Kendrick Lamar's work has changed the American social conscience by challenging the status quo, encouraging listeners to re-examine social institutions. His music served as the soundtrack for the 2016 presidential election, the Black Lives Matter movement, and furthermore, he won a Pulitzer Prize, just one of many examples illustrating how Kendrick's music has marked a major step forward for hip-hop being considered a legitimate artistic medium. You'll also see a long, long list of artists, both younger and older, who have called Kendrick a major influence on their work. Not just the grandly political yet deeply personal themes of his lyrics, but also the cinematic narratives and experimental yet mainstream musicianship of his songs. Kendrick is seen by many as being the messiah of modern rap, and it's not a title he's rejected. He's always been open about wanting to be the greatest rapper ever. Despite his private life and the calmness of his public image, he's the only artist outside of classical and jazz to ever be given the Pulitzer Prize for music, and he's consistently been ranked as one of the greatest rappers ever since he first came out. And that's a big part of why, despite the accolades, despite the fame, we don't really know much about Kendrick's life. He's a unique celebrity. He doesn't make a lot of public appearances, he doesn't share much on social media, and public details about his family are sparse. He disappears from the public eye for years at a time. People don't know where he is, or in some ways, who he is. On the one hand, this means Kendrick is free to have his art speak for itself. We don't know about his baggage, his secrets, his day-to-day, -day, just the messages in his music, which come through even clearer without the weight of celebrity dragging them down. Beyond the fact that we know he owns several homes valued in the tens of millions, just like every other celebrity of his size, I can't sit here and tell you what he drinks, what kind of plane he owns, and where he goes on vacation. Which also means we have no way of knowing if what Drake said was true or not. While Kendrick's persona creates the aura of privacy for the sake of protecting himself and his family, it's also also possible that he actually hides from the world to cover up his lack of parenting and commitment, meanwhile projecting a facade of responsibility and love to the outside world. Family matters instantly hit really hard. Drake called into question the core of Kendrick's persona, the same way Kendrick did it to him. And with both of them going for the throat, what could possibly happen next? How much deeper could it really go? Who's real and who's fake? 20 minutes after Family Matters called the entirety of Kendrick's persona into question, Kendrick dropped a nuke. Not an entertaining diss track, not making fun of Drake's raps or his lifestyle, but attacking the very core of his being for almost seven minutes straight. Because in the first verse from Euphoria, days earlier, Kendrick dropped two lines that foreshadowed the entire rest of the beef. Drake then went on to attack Kendrick's wife and kids in a seemingly completely unsubstantiated way. The only proof he had of Kendrick's son not being his own child was an Instagram comment comprised of just two emojis from Kendrick's best friend. The idea that Kendrick Lamar doesn't raise his own kids was the same way. The only proof that he had was simply that there wasn't proof of the opposite, not that there ever would be considering Kendrick Lamar's well-known, reclusive, personal life. Meet the Grams, though, is a deeply personal, scathing, angry, livid attack of Drake's character on top of a dark, sinister beat. Kendrick claims that Drake has even more children he doesn't even acknowledge, has a pill addiction, exhibits behavior and treatment of women comparable to Harvey Weinstein, and ultimately says outright that Drake deserves to die. He individually addressed Drake's immediate family. 
Dear Sandra, your son got some habits, I hope you don't undermine them. Especially with all the girls that's hurt inside this climate. You a woman, so you know how it feels to be in alignment. With emotions, hoping a man can see you and not be blinded. Dear Dennis, you gave birth to a master manipulator. Even using you to prove- He talks to Adonis about how to be better than his weak, unprincipled, lazy father who disrespects his heritage. He talks to Sandra and Dennis about their son not just disrespecting women, but also enabling and even participating in further, deeper, more disturbing activities. He talks to Drake's other kids about his lack of values and engagement in his personal life, preferring to go on vacation and take drugs than be a father. He then addresses Drake himself. We hear the police it. They be streamlining victims on the side of their home and calling them tender. Then leak videos, set themselves to further push their agendas. To any woman that be playing this music, know that you're playing your sister. Or better yet, selling your niece to the weirdos, not the good ones. Cat Williams that gave you the truth, so I'ma get mines. The embassy about to get ready too. It's only a matter of time. Hey, LeBron, keep the family away. Hey, Curry, keep the family away to anybody that embody the love for their kids keep the family away it might be the most hateful diss song ever made it's a truly disgusted dark assessment of who drake is as a human being kendrick chips away at the facade of his character to reveal an empty false idol with kendrick ultimately just recommending for drake to go to therapy and get his shit together because he's not just not a real rapper but not a real man the second family matters dropped it wasn't looking good for kendrick drake went right for kendrick's family and he came up with some pretty dark Dark stuff. At least it wasn't looking good for all of the 20 minutes until Meet the Grams dropped, and somehow it was such a dark, insane song that Kendrick accusing Drake of having another hidden child was probably the least memorable moment. It also strengthened the claim that Kendrick had a secret informant feeding him details about what Drake was going to do next. An entire song addressing and responding to Drake's family less than 30 minutes after Drake put out a song about Kendrick's family, it indicates pretty strongly that Kendrick had prior knowledge of what Drake was going to do next. Either that or Drake was just that outmatched. Meet the Grams alone was enough to end the beef for good. Very few times, if ever, has a rapper destroyed someone's persona like that, just completely ripping Drake's skeleton out of his body, so much so that no one even really cared if Drake completely denied having a daughter at all. It didn't matter. Kendrick had already ethered him. But then, 12 hours later, on top of all of that, Kendrick dropped the song of the summer. Not Like Us broke the Spotify record for the most single day streams of any hip hop song ever. It passed a record held by Drake for the past three years. It actually broke three of Drake's records in total, the most song streams ever in a week by a rapper and the fastest rap song to ever pass 100 million plays. Its content was simple, meet the grams, but make it funny. Say Drake, I hear you like I'm young. You better not ever go to sell black one. To any bitch that talk to him and they in love, just make sure you hide your little sister from him. They tell me Chubb's the only one that get your hand-me-downs And party at the party playing with his nose now And Baca got a weird case, why is he around? Certified lover boy, certified pedophiles wah, wah, wah. Drake did drop a response, but for the most part it was weak, it was sad, and the smell of defeat was pungent But it didn't matter either way the entire world had already decided Kendrick won. Within 12 hours, there were videos of Not Like Us being played at clubs and parties all over the world. Actors, athletes, singers, and influencers flocked to it online while it was played at sporting events all over the country. The battle was already over. Meet the Grimms was a nasty, dirty dissection of Drake's guts and how much Kendrick hates them. Not Like Us was the victory lap, an entertaining, catchy song reminding Drake not just that he lost, but Kendrick was going to make everyone in the world sing along to it. It's one thing to do a dark, lyrical takedown, but it's a whole other type of insult to make a song that works as a TikTok sound, but basically still calls you a pedophile. Again, Kendrick with the certified pedophiles line, reminding Drake that he's an outsider in hip hop and happens to be a terrible person on top of all of that, and with millions of people singing about Drake the pedophile, Drake the colonizer, there was nothing else to say. Not only did he pull off a perfect detailed takedown of Drake's existence, he also got his accusations blasting at max volume in every club and bar in America at the same time. Kendrick predicted it exactly right. He was always the better writer, he was always going to strategize better than Drake, but it turns out he can also make the more entertaining, funnier, catchier diss. And it didn't even matter that the grand reveal of a hidden daughter was probably a slip up. All Kendrick had to do was point out exactly what everyone already knew.
Drake has twice the amount of monthly Spotify listeners as there are black people in America. And studies have found that 70% of hip hop fans are white. It shouldn't be a huge surprise considering that's the exact same percentage as there are white Americans and rap is the most popular genre in the country. There's a way to look at it where it becomes clear that it doesn't really matter if Drake is real rap because at this point, neither is the audience. The average person who listens, they don't listen because they care about the black experience rap is deeply rooted in. Pop rap is cool because it's all about working hard, being lit, overcoming your struggles, having money, clothes, shoes, and cars. That's something that excites all Americans. Americans feel like we're born to be millionaires. Everyone wants designer clothes to drive a loud, fast car. We all think we're gonna be the next big thing. We're all in a frantic race to be better than the person next to us. Of course, most people relate to Drake's version of hip hop because he confuses the surface level characteristics with being the core of the genre and as a result, dumbs down the entire thing. There's a much smaller audience for music about processing generational trauma, battling your demons, documenting the black American experience, complex rhyme schemes, or even deeply personal storytelling about the psychologically, emotionally difficult experience of growing up in the inner city. In this way, I think Drake appeals to our vices. His music validates the parts of us that we should seek to be better than, justifying our egos, satisfying our lust, acting wrathful to the people around us. That's a lot of Drake's music. The issue is that isn't who he is. He was raised by a loving mother in a safe home with a humble yet decent upbringing. Making drill songs where he talks about popping his op's head off and paying for drive-by shootings, knowing that he went to Jewish day school and grew up saying he doesn't use slang, never working a day in his life beyond the entertainment industry, knowing he never went hungry or was exposed to violence or drugs, Drake isn't real hip hop. His songs might feel like hip hop, they might sound like hip hop, but it's the same way a book written by ChatGPT has all the ingredients of a book. Drake is an extremely good fake, the same way that AI voices are really good fakes. It just falls apart once you look at what he's made in totality and realize that none of it really speaks to anything true. None of it stays with you after you stop listening. There's no overarching theme, just a pleasant vibe. It's the musical equivalent of TikTok ads for games that don't exist. He's an actor who spent 15 years creating a highly convincing rapper persona until he got so popular, he himself forgot who he used to be. That's why the beef was such a huge win for Kendrick and what he represents. Obviously, he was always gonna beat Drake with better lyrics, more clever storytelling, but the fact he could also beat Drake at his own game by making catchier, more popular, more fun songs, Drake lost twice and I don't think that's what people expected. But that's still not the whole story. The diss tracks were truly brutal. Drake being a pedophile, enabling sex abusers, possibly hiding and neglecting his own children. This is true crime Jeffrey Epstein level stuff. But the same also goes for Kendrick. Not raising his kids, abusing and cheating on his wife, all while maintaining a strong facade of family values for the outside world. Suddenly, all of his music would be a white lie. But I think what says the most above all is that no one really cares. No one cares that Drake and Kendrick have both accused each other of truly terrible things and didn't even really address each other's accusations. They both left a mountain of unanswered questions. No one cares that Kendrick's entire persona could be made up and insincere. No one cares that Drake could be enabling sex abuse crimes. It's an underwhelming conclusion, but it's also expected. After Kendrick's diss tracks, Drake's daily listeners only dropped by 5% and just for a few days. It goes back to the state of culture as a whole. Any genre that gets big enough gets commodified and watered down. The fact that someone who shares absolutely none of the defining traits of the artists who created his genre can come in and become the biggest, most successful, best-selling artist to ever touch it, it's not surprising that the person who's doing this is an outsider in the culture itself. It's only surprising until you realize that the vast majority of the consumers of this genre are also outsiders in the culture. Drake and Kendrick are ultimately more so reflections of ourselves than they are their own people. We will most likely never know if Kendrick's personal revelations and reflections are a lie or if Drake has more secret children. And of course, we can't forget that the people who profit the most from this beef are them. For both Kendrick and Drake, the biggest thing to come out of this beef is a paycheck. That's why who you pick as the winner says more about you than it does about them. Do you value the personal journey towards self-awareness, love, and peace? Or do you want to feed your ego and your pride and be entertained? There's a place for both. Drake's music will probably stay in my library for a while. I can't lie, I've listened to and liked a lot of his music. It's not deep, 
It's not real, but it's entertaining and it sounds cool. But when Drake calls himself a thug, when he talks about ordering hits on his ops, the same way it means nothing to him, it also means nothing to me. I don't actually personally identify with nearly anything he says. I don't have shooters, I'm not a gangster, but neither was Drake until he decided to change the very fabric of who he was to become a rapper. Whatever your choice is, wanting real art or wanting to listen to something fun, wanting to know the truth about the artists you listen to or not caring at all, just remember, following neither Kendrick nor Drake will ever get you there. But at least Kendrick has the decency to say it to your face. If you're interested in more of my creations, my new brand Spirit World just relaunched our sold out necklace after it's been back ordered for six months. Every necklace is made of full 925 sterling silver with hand painted enamel and the design of a sun rising over a night full of silver stars. They're designed by me and the brand directly supports Volksgeist while also telling stories with powerful meaning for every creative person. I made the necklaces to be a reminder that whatever your goal is, the only way to reach it is to just keep going. Whatever kind of success you're chasing, persistence and belief is the key, because there can't be any light without dark. There can't be success without struggle. If you want to support my work and buy a pendant from our collection, feel free to pick up at the link below. And shipping is free in the US forever, so go to spiritworld.store to buy a necklace now or stick till the end for a discount code that's just for my viewers. Plus one random buyer from the first 10 orders off this video will have their purchase completely refunded and will get their necklace for free. 